What happens if the memory is kept in someone else's memory, but not yours? Well, you have some sort of, uh, I don't know, movement towards immortality, depending on if the other memory is permanent, or the other person holding the memory in some sense, medium that's holding it. So there might be a permanent record, so to speak, of such and such. Uh, it's only permanent, of course, in as far as it is permanent. Uh, you know, if it's written in stone, but the stone degenerates over millions of years, then well, it wasn't permanent, I guess, you know. But it did affect a great deal of time, potentially. You know, it was there to be read, so. Well, that's interesting, too, because if it's not accessed, this permanent record, you know, the memory's there, potentially you can access it, but you haven't. Then, in some sense, well, the past event um, is not having opportunity to influence the present situation, say. Unless, of course, the past event has changed the present situation, which, in a sense, all events do that. You know, if I um, put the light on it now, I use power which affects the amount of power affecting other things that could be done that affect the future. And in some sense, there's an effect of the past on the present and the future. And, uh, of course, history is the study of that effect. How is so-and-so uh, affecting the time series of events and what we have now and well, that seems to open as for future possibilities and so on. So our being and experience, our um, understanding of time, past, present and future, uh, the notion of memory and cause and effect, and the continuity of such through time, you know, the ball's moving at the minute and therefore it will be moving in the next moment of time unless it's blocked by uh, something else that comes into that period of time, like the position of something in the way, like the bat. And the movement of that could be premeditated. In other words, you um, spend some time in some present changing the course of events in anticipation of the continuing future, otherwise, of something. So we become agents in this unfolding of experience of the present that seems to be coming towards us from a future which we can alter. And this is the essence of life, isn't it? It's simply able to um, affect the future by what it does in the now. Although what it does in the now is possibly totally dependent on the past totality of events. Or if you like, I think I'll hold to that. Now, let me see if I can clinch this. This is knowing God. Um, sorry, this is life eternal, to know God. To know the character of the infinite, um, the all of all future that is and can be made to understand God is to have absolute mastery of the future. Um, but it's, by the looks of it, it also implies that um, you are part of this totality of the future that you're looking at. Um, and that what you are 
is a consequence of that totality, not some independent existence of it, to it. Now the whole supposition is that God is and is not what is not. He is the all of what is and what can be. Um, and he chooses according to some conceived of extremely desirable infinite viewpoint which is his own viewpoint being vested with the all of understanding and knowing and that this is such a, an awesome understanding of his being that well nothing else stands in existence really by comparison except he holds it to be um, if you like temporarily compartmentalized into such distinct beings so if he if he divides himself into a whole series of if you like infinite beings that are infinite in that they relate well with each other they're not contradicting each other they are harmonious but finite in the sense that they are contained to be independent or distinct or different or quite simply it's himself compartmentalized into vast family, heavenly host, utterly wonderful beings, consistent with himself, and, and therefore the absolute paramount importance of harmony rather than contradiction. Contradiction is, if you like, something to do with chaos and unreliability and we are saying, no, there's an incredible integrity, an infinite integrity, except it affords life. It affords the individualness of the individual characters, persons that have come into existence. Um, but somehow these individualities have either a perfect consistency, complete, or sufficient harmony to allow um, the inharmony to itself be a benefit and a blessing. You know, it's a bit like a little um, spice in the food is most helpful, in a sense, or at least it encourages um, uh, one to eat it. It makes the meal a pleasant activity. If the, if the meal were always such a ghastly, unpleasant activity, you'd starve to death, you wouldn't be keeping the body, would you? So it may well be that God allows um, uh, that the individuality is a potential in harmony, but um, it's kept in, for argument's sake, utterly safe bounds by um, the overall devotion of the individuals to each other's welfare. So, I'm concerned with your welfare and you're concerned with mine and, 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 and both of us are concerned with both welfares. Um, I nonetheless though see your welfare as being potentially helped by something that you're not in quite agreement with. So you think we'll have a lovely time if we go to the cinema this evening. I'm not so sure. I think we'd have a lovely time sitting at home reading to each other. Um, and there's some sort of tension between the two. Now that's a creative tension in that we're going to, how about a compromise? Well, mm, we compromised last night. Then how about tonight me doing what you want and tomorrow night you doing what I want? Would we actually find that more exciting, more interesting, better? lovely in some way. In other words, there's such a tremendous harmony between us that 
the difference is are the spice of life, <laughs> if you know what I mean. And I think that's what we do, eh, Matt, in the family, and quite happy to accept anyway that every member of the family is unique. Um, um, even identical twins are unique in being virtually identical, and perhaps identical, you know, um, perhaps not too identical if they're both saying the same things at the same time, literally. It might get a bit confusing, but even that would be a, an interesting uniqueness, wouldn't it? I don't know. Well, to come back to what's the benefit of this analysis. Well, the life that we probably hold to be truly of value is um, an eternal life of harmony, of beauty and goodness and joy and peace and, and creativity and integrity and um, loving kindness and the list is well known and uh, to worship such to pursue such the personification of such seems to be the way to go <laughs> well taste and see and the prodigal did he thought well it's this way I'll um not be too concerned about the long run future. I go and spend that which is falling to me. And then, of course, he did eventually end up in his future, and it was the pits, you know, he's in the big sty there, poor chap, and he longs to go home. And he's still in a position of life, it's just that life is extremely tough and hard. Uh, but he can choose to return to his father. And it's knowing that he can return, albeit at some cost compared to what he originally had, it would be of great benefit compared to what he's suffering at present. And the wonderful thing is that when he does return, his dad well, just loves him to bits. And he, he wasn't really expecting that. But of course he was seeing, um, he was seeing his disloyalty to dad as, um, Paramount, whereas his dad was seeing the love between the two of them that's potentially there as paramount. So he has a lovely dad. And we try to be lovely dads. Well, if you're a brother, if you're a mum, you try to be a lovely mum. Now, can I just uh, pop in there the obvious that we don't succeed in being the lovely dad or mum that we really, in hindsight, would like to have been. And that's okay. God understands. Um, don't beat yourself up about it. He'd rather you just look to him and trusted him for it. And were filled with joy that you can trust him utterly for it. Because he loves you. It's as simple as that. Thank you, Heavenly Father. I think the recording is meant to capture in my mind the notion behind living in eternity's sunrise. Um, and that's a sort of timeless state of being that's um, that is a transcendence the desired transcendence which is another way of saying the same thing I suppose <laughs> I'm going to end up with a tautology of some sort but um, and have done probably but Our experience of the words gives the impression that's correct of what I mean. Some continual ongoing experience of the eternal that is good.
and eternal across the present too. I see your face in every sunrise. The colours of the morning are in your eyes. You know, that we see the goodness of God in every face, in everywhere we look. The fullness, the loveliness, the goodness of God is there in every aspect of every moment of time. We are just consumed in his lovely goodness. Loveliness, goodness, I can't quite say it all in one go. It's a uh, I was going to say the most conceivable, the, the utterly inconceivable, really, bliss. Um, and I don't mean ecstatic something or other, but whatever bliss means. And that depends on how you've used the word, doesn't it? I know. Can't communicate outside how we've used the words, can we? except to have felt something that the words trigger a remembrance of. And uh, you then say, ah, oh, I know what you mean. Mm. <laughs> I've experienced that. Been there. Mm. I understand what you're trying to communicate. And the poet is brilliant at doing that. The writer who, or the speaker who somehow uses Words that have the appropriate connotation to what is wanting to be expressed. They have the, the correct connotation in the hearer's understanding of it. And and something beautiful. <laughs> So when I sing, when I worship, you know, God, you're beautiful, you're beautiful. In that same song, I see your face in every sunrise. You're beautiful, you're beautiful. I'm referring to that loveliness of the presence of God. And, and even the phrase, of course, the presence of God is... is um, uh, is being voiced because we're trying to remind you of a certain conceptual experience. Of the person of God. So appreciated by us. Yes, thank you, Heavenly Father. Yep, got it. Um, the transcendent state of life eternal is of infinite value. And therefore, the whole of life is... trivial in cost compared to that gain. Even where the probability of tr such transcendence is terribly low, incredibly low, a minute possibility, probability, stroke, you know, possibility, probability of life eternal, of that transcendence, is worth any temporary life here in this world. That's the logic behind it. To discount an infinite possible future is madness. You're 
discount rate would have to be 100%, in which case you couldn't even live now. Your um, present unit of time would be approaching zero to achieve that. Quite simply, you would not exist for the option to be there. Forget about all, all the analysis and the words and the jargon and the junk. Well, not junk, but the analysis and so on. In everyday language, the possibility of heaven, even if it didn't transform the immediate future into goodness, would still be worth um, putting before any present that you have. And it's the case that the present and the immediate future that you have is made so much better, fulfilling, meaningful and happy by putting this transcendent life eternal first. That it would be madness not to do so. <laughs> Thank you, Dad. <laughs>